In the research I carried out among wellbeing leads, there were commonly three types of barriers to change that were mentioned. Ingrained behaviours such as bullying and stigmatisation of stress and mental health issues are still widespread. The second one was a lack of understanding of what wellbeing is and what it means. And finally, the third one uh, was around issues of wellbeing authenticity. Wellbeing authenticity has been a growing area of research in recent years. The term is used to describe how aligned organisations' stated values are with their actual commitment to um, wellbeing and their actions. The opposite being the term wellbeing washing, which you might have come across and means that organisations appear to care publicly about employee wellbeing, but they fail to follow up with an effective um, strategy internally. In fact, there's a long history underlying this concept of authenticity, a topic for another post, but in a nutshell, it relates to deeper philosophical views about the interests of the organisation and the interests of employees. For a long time, it was believed that employee wellbeing and work performance were actually in conflict. Either you prioritised employee wellbeing or work performance, but it would always be at the expense of the other. Nowadays, there's a recognition that you can have a win-win and that investing in employee well-being can, in fact, lead to increased performance. The thing is that for this to work, employees must believe that the organisation's motives are genuine. If they perceive the organisation is sincere in its commitment to employees' interests, employees are more likely to reciprocate with discretionary effort. In other words, trust is a key ingredient to workplace wellbeing effectiveness. And there's a number of studies already telling us what key factors are involved in building this trust. High on the list is consistency. Authenticity builds over time and past actions inform current expectations. Research during the pandemic showed, for example, that organisations that sprang into action and suddenly started to introduce wellbeing interventions or initiatives could be met with some scepticism from employees. It's also about following through on promises and following communications with tangible and ongoing efforts. Another key factor is mutual support between leaders and staff and employees feeling that they're involved in the rollout and the communication of the wellbeing programme. When I interviewed wellbeing leads for my own research, I was fascinated to discover wellbeing leads take on this. When you think about it, wellbeing leads are in an ideal position to see both sides, to understand where the organisation's coming from, as well as the point of view of employees. Yes, there were absolutely cases where wellbeing washing or yoghurt and yoga, as, as they call it, were mentioned. Wellbeing as a PR strategy for attracting talent and enhancing general reputation did come up but far more rarely than I thought it would. In fact, wellbeing leads brought a lot of nuance to the idea of organisations being authentic or not in their approach to wellbeing. Do sticking plaster wellbeing policies exist? Absolutely. Does box ticking happen? Does it still happen frequently? Yes. The interesting thing is that wellbeing leads thought that wellbeing washing is often unintentional. Organisations juggling different priorities, budgets being a real challenge at the moment, or simply not realising that what they're doing is wellbeing washing. Most frequently it's down to the fact that change takes time and introducing authentic wellbeing is a huge change of culture for many organisations. Something that authenticity research also recognises Organisations at the early stages of a wellbeing strategy are more likely to be viewed as inauthentic. So what's the best approach for organisations on this journey? 
In my next post, I'll share some thoughts on wellbeing interventions and how to prioritise next steps when it comes to wellbeing implementation.